make the next move, which is usually a pretty fast and, and fatal one. So what has happened to the Kakapo since, uh, since human beings arrived there is that its population has dropped from, we don't know what it was, maybe as many as a million, probably not quite as many as that, to the low 40s. That's a terrible, terrible, catastrophic drop. And um, so there's whole teams of people who are working very, very hard to try and conserve this animal. But they run into a problem, which is not only is the kakapo completely unable to defend itself, but it has another problem, which has to do with its reproductive techniques. Now, its reproductive techniques are incredibly long drawn out, very complicated, and almost totally ineffective. <laughs> now, some people tell you that the mating call of the male kakapo actively repels the female kakapo, <laughs> which is a sort of behavior otherwise only really sort of fine in discos. Um, <clears throat> but let me tell you about the mating call of the kakapo. What, what it does in the sort of mating season, which is about 100, 100 days of the year, is it finds itself a big, rocky outcrop overlooking on sort of great sort of huge valleys of fjord land. Uh, and it finds itself this uh, rocky outcrop overlooking the valley because acoustics are very important to what it's about to do. And it sort of digs itself out a kind of bowl that, it's, that it sits in, and it puffs out these two enormous air sacs around its chest that form reverberation chambers. And it sits there in its bowl for 100 nights of the year, eight hours a night, and for all that period, it sits there and sits there and performs over and over and over again the opening bars of Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> now, now, those of you, the grey-haired ones around here who can remember Dark Side of the Moon, <laughs> will remember that it starts with this deep, sort of throbbing heartbeat. Mm, mm, mm. And this is the noise that the kakapo makes, this deep, throbbing, booming noise. Mm, mm, mm. And, uh, in fact, those people who have heard it will tell you that, to begin with, you don't even hear it. You feel it more like a sort of wobble in the pit of your stomach, and gradually your, your ear tunes in, and you can just hear this mm, mm, mm sound. And, and the sound rolls through the valleys, um, and it's very, very deep bass sound. Now, there are two important characteristics of bass sound, one of which is that these great long wavelengths of bass sound travel great distances, and they fill the valleys because they've got a long way to reach, see if they can find a female kakapo. But if there is a female kakapo out there, which there probably isn't, and if she likes the sound of this booming, which it turns out she probably doesn't, <laughs> and if she decides, okay, well, I'll go and look for the male kakapo, you then come up across, across a problem that comes from the other characteristic of bass sound, which is this... Uh, are you familiar with those kind of stereo sets you can get um, uh, where the speaker system consists of two tiny little treble speakers that you have to place very accurately in the room because they're going to define the stereo image? And then you have a thing called a sort of subwoofer or a boombox, which is sort of a great thing with, uh, that you can put anywhere in the room you like. You can put it behind the sofa, if you like, um, because the other characteristic of bass sound, and remember we're talking about the, male, the mating sound of the male kakapo, is that you can't tell where it's coming from. <laughs> so supposing, while the male is making his mating call, uh, supposing there's a female out there, which there probably isn't, and supposing he hears that she likes the booming, which she probably doesn't, she will then not be able to find <laughs> the male kakapo. Now, assuming she manages to overcome this problem as well, then um, uh, we can't look up another problem, which is the female kakapo will only consent to mate when the podocarp tree is in fruit. <laughs> now... Uh, <laughs> We've all had relationships a little like that. Um, <laughs> but if they've got through all those obstacles, 
the female kakapo finally sort of lays one egg, one egg every two or three years. And you think, so far from trying to sort of preserve this animal, how on earth has it made it this long? How on earth has it managed to survive this long? And the answer is a very interesting one. And it's also interesting that it should be such a puzzle to us. Now, before man set foot on New Zealand, and when he arrived there, man arriving, particularly the West, uh, men arriving from Western Europe, it looks like the home counties. It's all sort of green and lush. And we don't see, we don't see that the moment we set foot on it, it changes fundamentally because before man set foot on New Zealand, there were no predators there. And the moment we set foot on it, there are predators there. So we never see an environment with no predators where the rules work in a very, very different way. Now, any given species, any given animal's reproductive strategy is, is determined by a number of factors. Reproducing, producing young, is a very expensive activity. It takes a huge amount of bodily resources. It takes a, takes a huge amount of energy. It takes a huge amount of time. You, in order, you, you're basically going to produce enough young so that your genes will continue, um, uh, continue to pl proliferate. If you're making, if you if you come up with more young than you need to fulfil that thing, then you are um, uh, then you're running against the sort of grain of nature, which is to be extremely abstemious um, and, uh, and and to conserve energy. So, the rate at which the the, the the kakapos used to reproduce, the rate at which they used to reproduce was exactly the right one for have a sustaining a, a stable population in an environment with no predators. If they had reproduced at a higher rate, then in fact there would have been too many of them. Now I don't want to sort of head off into group selection territory uh, for the, those of you who are uh, um, students of evolution, but essentially it would have happened that uh, um, um, if, a, if a population grows too fast, it hits at kind of rather too acute an angle um, the ability of, of the environment to sustain that population, whereupon you, your population drops off rather sharply. And in fact, you can, uh, uh, if, if the population oscillates too fast, then you can get to the point where, in fact, sort of chaos theory takes over and the population just, uh, uh, just oscillates wildly and can hit zero at any moment just out of the sheer maths of it. And once you've hit zero, of course, it's not going to go up again. Um, but the point is, their reproduction rate was exactly the right reproduction rate for an environment with no predators. And the fact that it's puzzling to us is because we've never known an environment with no predators, because any environment that has us in it is an environment that has predators. Whoa! <laughs> um, sorry, man. <laughs> my life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> Uh, including the notes of my speech. Um, <laughs> so, what can we learn or understand from the uh, from what the from the plight the kakapo finds itself in? Well, think of um, let's be naughty again and anthropomorphize, because what is happening is something like this: that it has a reproductive strategy that it served it very, very well, a lifestyle that has served it very, very well um, in the environment it grew up in. And even though that environment has suddenly changed, it doesn't know, it doesn't have any means of adapting. It doesn't have any means of looking at itself in its context. It merely has its evolved instinct to go on. And its evolved instinct tells it that this is the right rate to reproduce. So it suddenly finds itself in crisis because its population is dropping. So it's almost as if the thing is thinking, well, here we are in crisis. Let's do what we're really good at, which is to reproduce really slowly. <laughs> and their population goes down even further. They say, oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, we better, better try really hard to reproduce really, really, really slowly. 
And, of course, it's, it's a completely futile strategy in the new environment.